All right, I would love to get through all 18 of these verses tonight so that we'll be ready for chapter 18 next week. So we will try to do that. If you have questions as we go or comments, information to add, please uh, jump right in with those. Uh, but I'll try to, to move through this in an efficient way. Uh, do, I, do want to do some introductory to the chapter, some background information. I'll start with some things that Roper shares in his commentary. Uh, he talks about there being a progressive scenario in the book of Revelation regarding uh, the destruction of Babylon the Great. That's, that's a theme that you're reading about as you go through the book. It begins with an announcement from an angel in chapter 14, but not really any details given there. It's just mentioned. Then in chapter 16, the climax of the bowls of wrath section was the destruction of Babylon. So it's mentioned... Uh, it was depicted, and we talked a little bit about it last week, as a city split into three parts. So there's, you're getting more and more information shared, yet there still remain many questions that aren't answered. But then chapters 17 through 19 reveal the full story of Babylon's destruction. Chapter 17, there appears this explanation that we get in this chapter regarding the identity of Babylon... And the identity, if you've read the chapter, would be what city? What city are we thinking of when we think of Babylon the Great? We're thinking of Rome. And, and as we go through this, original audience, and it's one of the questions we keep coming back to, what would the original audience, what would be in their mind as they read the letter? Uh, the, the clues that are there, everybody's going to be thinking Rome. Uh, chapter 18, the fall, is going to be more graphically portrayed. Chapter 19, there will be rejoicing among the faithful over her fall. And so one of the things Roper mentions is that the amount of space devoted to the fall of Babylon indicates the significance of this event. I mean, that's the relief uh, that these persecuted Christians have on their mind. And, and so it seemingly would make sense. He also shares some of what others have said about this chapter overall. Uh, Barclay holds that 17 is one of the most difficult chapters in Revelation. Homer Haley called verses 8 through 11 perhaps the most difficult passage in the entire book to interpret. Henry Sweat said that the passage is an enigma for which more than one solution may be found. Edward McDowell wrote that we can only guess at the meaning of the riddle of the seven kings and the beast that was and is not. And so for those reasons, uh, a lot of people have come to many conclusions about the chapter. Roper holds that part of our difficulty may be that most of us are not all that familiar with apocalyptic literature. He also states that it's possible that we make it more complicated than God really intended it to be. And, and there can be some, some validity in that. He says perhaps the passage is not intended to be a quiz on how much we know about the Roman emperors it may not be necessary to identify each individual king in verses 10 through 12. And he may be right because you really have to make some assumptions when you start trying to assign names to uh, what's there because you have to pick a starting point to arrive at an ending point. And, and there's nothing that's going to specifically tell you where to start. Also, the main purpose of the chapter he says, is probably not to identify the Caesar on the throne when Revelation was written or to give a Christian twist to the idea that Nero would return in some way, whether that be uh, Domitian coming back as Nero all over again or whatever. He says, rather, John's intention for his readers with his, was that they might understand Rome was heading for destruction, and the message for readers today is that all opposition to the Lord will ultimately be put down. And he's right in that. Uh, if that was John's message for today, we don't know, but, but there were certain things that he was trying to communicate to his original audience. When you uh, look at some of what Kester wrote about this, he says the vision John now describes, it's a counterpart to the story of the woman and the dragon that began in Acts 2, or Act 2 of Revelation. Remember the, the, the woman giving birth dragon hovering over her, ready to snatch the child, but at the last moment, the child and the woman, they, they go to safety. Um, the people of God, he says, were personified as this woman who gave birth to the Messiah who would then rule all the nations. 
dragon hovered, waiting to snatch the child, but the woman got away, was pursued into the wilderness, and the dragon was cast down from heaven to earth, where it made war on the saints and deceived the nations through a seven-headed beast. That was chapter 12, verse 1 through 13, verse 10. So he says, then in this chapter, John will now be taken into the wilderness, that's verse 3, which offers him refuge from the lies of the dragon and the threat of the beast, allowing him to see this insidious power for what it is. In, in other words, in the vision, taken to a place of safety where he can see things um, in their proper perspective. She sits on many waters, verse 1, related to her relationship with mankind, her relationship with the empire. She rides the scarlet beast, that is the first beast described to us back in 13, verse 1. And so the women in Revelation 12 first, and then in Revelation 17, they're portrayed in sharply contrasting ways in order to win the reader's allegiance to the persecuted woman who represents the people of God and to alienate them from Babylon the harlot who represents the adversaries of God. And of course, remember over and over, God's team wins. Pick a team, uh, choose wisely. And so what Kester's saying is he's saying these contrasting visions of these two different women should help us in choosing a side. The portrayal of the harlot is designed to unmask the seductive social, economic, and religious forces that dull the reader's perceptions and to startle them into a keener awareness of what faith really means. Uh, he reminds us, and you remember early on in our study, the study of Sardis and Laodicea, they had been lulled into complacency by their wealth. And uh, Pergamum, Thyatira, they seemed willing to accommodate the empire's religious practices in the interest of social harmony. In other words, we'll put up with this so that we can get along, make our way in society, not be complete outcasts. And so the last introductory comment from Kester, he says, Revelation's use of feminine imagery draws heavily on stereotypes. Positive figures are the mother of chapter 12 and the bride, chapter 19, chapter 21. The negative one is the harlot that we see in this chapter. And so we'll dive in, read some verses, talk about this a little bit. First, uh, we'll, we'll start with verse 1, read through about verse 6 or verse 7. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me saying... Come here, and I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. Now, when you get over to verse 15, we'll have that explained to us, and I'll read it now. He said to me in verse 15, The waters which you saw where the, where the harlot sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And so four is the number of humanity. So it's talking about, uh, you know, it's basically describing everyone. Verse 2, with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality and those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. Um, the dynasty of the Herods, uh, the kings of earth who committed acts of immorality. If you remember the dynasty of the Herods, they were in place but under the control of Rome. And... Uh, they reigned at Rome's discretion, and so you could think of folks like that when you think of statements, the kings of the earth who committed acts of immorality and those kinds of things. And he carried me away in the spirit, this is verse 3, into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast full of blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was clothed in pure purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a gold cup full of abominations and of the unclean things of her immorality. And on her forehead a name was written, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. Uh, Roman prostitutes, were told, often wore headbands. Sometimes headbands were used as advertising. Uh, and if you're an older person like me, uh, when I read about headbands and advertising, uh, I go back to uh, Jim McMahon, who played quarterback for the Chicago Bears in the mid-'80s, because he got into this big, this big row with the NFL about what can I wear and what can I not wear, and he would wear these headbands, and they didn't have the right branding on them, 
and they didn't like it. And so then he started writing messages on the headbands. And you, you never knew week to week what the message might be on the headband. And then they said, well, you can't wear a headband. So then he took his headband and he, he pulled it down here and he wore it around his neck. And it wasn't a headband anymore. It was a neckband. And so it just, but headbands and advertising. So we're not thinking of a headband here in verse 5. Probably something stamped across the forehead in, in the image. But then verse 6, And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered greatly. And the angel said to me, Why do you wonder? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and, ten, and, and uh, the ten horns. So uh, when Kester writes about the first six verses, he writes about how... Satire is being used to help describe the harlot. And when we think about satire, we used to think about political cartoons in the newspaper. Anybody read the newspaper anymore? Maybe a few, but not many. And so when you think about satire today, how do we get our satire? What do we look at to get satire? We get memes on our phones, right? And, and so the meme, it all works in the same way. If you think about what happens in a political cartoon, you take the identifiable features of the person being lampooned. Maybe they've got um, a strange hairdo or strange, you know, facial features like a nose, but the cartoonist will magnify whatever the, that part of the, the visualization is because, so you know who that is. Uh, and then political groups are identified with symbols, elephant, donkey, whatever, and then if the identity of an image in a political cartoon is ever in doubt, the artist will write the name on the picture. And that's kind of the, the headband sort of thing that we read about in verse 5. But in satire, you show relationships between global or national powers and the way they depict them in the, image, in, the, in the picture. So you might have, of course, an Uncle Sam is the U.S., and so he might be, be depicted sitting comfortably astride the elephant, or being trampled under the elephant, or being kicked by the donkey. And so all of those things would have meaning to us because we know what the images are and we know what they mean. And so satire, he says, is used to show readers something they might not see otherwise, and its humorous elements contribute to its persuasive power. So if people can be persuaded to think that what appears impressive is actually ridiculous, then what seems glamorous is actually garish, and what appears desirable is in fact ludicrous, then they may be more ready to resist it. And so he says, John's portrait using satire of the great city works in a similar way. Instead of using a beautiful and dignified lady as its emblem, John pictures it, pictures her as this prostitute. Instead of virtue and nobility, she's pictured as reeling in a drunken stupor. Instead of sitting astride an elegant steed, she clings to the back of an outrageous seven-headed beast. Instead of raising a cup of wine, uh, she's going to be shown raising basically a cup of sewage. And so the pretentious lady is, in fact, he says, a contemptible buffoon. And so if you think about what you know about satire and apply some of that here... It, it maybe helps make sense of what's going on. He says, further, the portrait of this harlot draws on a wealth of like where a donkey and an elephant and Uncle Sam, the, the, the drawing of Uncle Sam, when, where those all have meaning to us, images he's using would have had meaning to those who knew their Old Testaments. So in the Old Testament, Israel's relationship with God is compared to a marriage, that occurs in Exodus chapter 20. God is the husband, Israel is the bride. By worshiping other gods, Israel violated their marriage covenant, assuming the role of a prostitute who embraced many lovers. You get that in Hosea 2, Jeremiah 2, Jeremiah 3, Ezekiel 16. Then he says, The unfaithful one might dress in crimson and deck herself with ornaments of gold, but the prophets warned that it all would be in vain, for in the end her lovers would destroy her. Jeremiah 4 verse 30 which is the fate of Babylon in Revelation 17, verse 16. The harlot in Revelation 6, 17, she's dressed like a queen, yet the text is showing her for what she really is. 
There were also some cities described as prostitutes in the Old Testament. Tyre in Isaiah 23, Nineveh in Nahum chapter 3. And then memories of Babylon the Great, the name inscribed on the harlot's forehead, contribute even more directly to John's portrait of the city. Babylon was enthroned by many waters, Jeremiah 51. If the harlot held a cup in her hand and made the nations drunk, as verses 2 through 4 talk about, Jeremiah previously had said that Babylon was a golden cup in the Lord's hand, making all the earth drunken with its mind-numbing power. Nevertheless, in its run for success, Babylon eventually tripped and fell under divine judgment. That's Jeremiah 51, verse 8. Same will be true of the harlot in Revelation. So, again, stock imagery, images that the people originally receiving this letter would have had meaning to them. So they would have connected Babylon the harlot with Rome, the city set on seven hills. We'll get that in verse 9 of our text, whose power was both cruel and seductive. Babylon destroyed the first temple in Jerusalem. Rome destroyed the second temple, or would destroy the second temple if you happen to be an early dater. The Romans shed the blood of saints and the blood of the witnesses to the Jesus in the ruthless persecutions that took place under Nero and in other sporadic acts of violence. Um, not all Christians, though, considered Roman rule intolerable. Some were trying to get along. Some maybe weren't being persecuted per se. The Roman Empire stretched across many waters, as 17 verse 1 talks about, from Europe to Asia. Sea trade flourished, and we'll see that again in chapter 18. Many of the inhabitants of the earth, 17 verse 2, including some Christians, became intoxicated with the prosperity that the Romans provided and were seduced into accepting the deification of certain emperors. In other words, even though I'm a Christian, if going along with this can make me wealthy... I'm all right with that. John's lampoon of the great harlot was designed to move first century readers to resist uh, being seduced by the power and wealth of Rome into compromising that don't compromise your loyalties of God just because Rome can do some amazing things for you. So one of the questions, should Rome be what comes to mind when you think of Babylon being described here? Roper states that to be exactly what the original readers would have thought of. He goes on to say, even writers, scholars who do not believe that Babylon refers to the city of Rome do agree that that's what the minds of early Christians would have thought of. So now why would they disagree? I didn't do a deep dive on that. But even those folks agree that that's what the Christians would have been thinking about when they read this. So Roper says... If the Holy Spirit had not intended for John's readers to think of Rome, he would have needed to add the disclaimer, I do not mean Rome. I mean, that's to the point all of this points to Rome. Roper goes on to add a comment from Frank Pack who reminds us that most would agree Babylon the Great symbolizes far more than the city of ancient Rome with all of its corruption. He says it symbolizes all of the influences and powers of a God-rejecting world under its various forms through the ages. So, uh, in some generations past, specifically which generations Roper doesn't go into detail on, one of the most popular interpretations of Babylon the Great was that she represented the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, Roper holds that Catholicism is probably better represented by the false prophet, since Babylon here is described as a prostitute rather than as an adulterer, who's unfaithful to her husband. You can decide what you think about that. Uh, he, do, he continues, she's not depicted in chapter 17 through 19 as a religious figure, but as a commercial political entity. Uh, one more word about harlotry. Obviously, when we think about that, we think about sexual prostitution, which is appropriate to think about in, when you see the word, and Rome in those days has been described as a filthy sewer, morally. But there is more to the word than that. Uh, Roper reminds us that the word prostitution can be used in a general sense to refer to the selling of one's abilities, talents, or name for an unworthy cause. So he states, the great harlot was guilty of the prostitution of all that is right and noble, 
to the questionable ends of power and luxury. Uh, also regarding that word, Nineveh in the Old Testament was the harlot of conquest, Nahum chapter 3. Tyre was talked about as the harlot of commerce, Isaiah chapter 23. Babylon was the mistress of pleasure, Isaiah 47. Jerusalem was guilty of religious whoredom, and you get that over and over, Isaiah 1, Jeremiah 2, Ezekiel 16, uh, uh, Hosea chapter 9. Uh, so anything you all want to add related to those first verses of the chapter? I know I'm moving kind of fast and, and just moving along trying to get through, but anything you all want to add to that? So the first description being when people see it from what they see, and then God, it's a good point, and then God seeing, revealing what he sees. That's a really good point. Makes us think of when David's being chosen as king and everybody's got their idea of what a king needs to look like and, and you know, same as finally, is there another son? Because we've not found the right guy yet. And, um, and then you get the famous quote about God seeing the heart not looking at things the way man does. So, good point. Appreciate you bringing that up. The next section, which Kester entitles The Significance of the Harlot. Let's read some more. Um, let me see how far I want to read before we stop and talk through. Let's read down to... Well, I'll, I'll start and I'll read 7 again and we'll read through about 13. Angel said to me, Why do you wonder? I will tell you the mystery of the woman. And of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast that you saw was, and is not, and is about to come out of the abyss and go to destruction. And those who dwell on the earth, whose name uh, has not, excuse me, and those who dwell on the earth, whose name has not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, will wonder when they see the beast, and he was, and is not, and will come. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits, and they are seven kings. Five have fallen, one is. The other has not yet come, and when he comes, he must remain a little while. The beast which was and is not is himself also an eighth and is one of the seven, and he goes to destruction. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. Of course, an hour a brief period of time. These have one purpose, and they give their power and authority to the beast. So the beast in verse 8 that you saw was and is not, uh, there is a thought that perhaps John was writing during a time when there may have been a brief respite from persecution. That's one possibility. Uh, but one thing that's stressed here, when it talks about those folks whose name has not been written uh, from the foundation of the world, uh, we're, we're talking here about the eternal purpose of God, and, and that's what's going to come out, the eternal purpose of God. Eventually, uh, this, this prostitute riding the beast, the beast's going to turn on her, and it's all going to happen because it's what God wants to happen. So, again, Kester entitles this section The Significance of the Harlot, Regarding the seven-headed beast, um, we learned previously in our study that the seven-headed seven -headed beast is the ally of Satan, the seven-headed dragon. That's chapter 12, verse 3, chapter 13, verse 3. Previously, we found that the beast has imitated Christ. It was slaughtered and yet lives. Again, that's chapter 13, verses 3, 12, and 14. Now the beast mimics God since God is the one who was... Um, and is, and is to come, chapter 4, verse 8. And now the beast was and is not, is about to ascend from the bottomless pit. The similarities between God and the beast heighten the sense of conflict between them, for they represent two forms of power and two contending claims. Again, this is from Kester. The direction set by the beast leads to destruction, while that set by God leads to what will ultimately be the new creation, chapter 21, verse 1. 
Kester also notes the angel's comments about the beast are supporting the idea that John's letter is not written in code, but that he used evocative symbols to convey multiple dimensions of meaning. And so he talks a little, because some people will say, well, maybe Revelation was written in some kind of code so the Christians would understand and other people wouldn't. But his point here is, the original audience, what would they have immediately known about this? Um, when you talk about seven mountains, chapter 17, verse 9, you're talking about Rome. Everybody knew that. John, if he's trying to get a letter off Patmos and he's trying to write it in a way so his Roman captors don't get it, if they read it, they get it. Because everybody knows the seven hills, the se you know, everybody knows this is Rome language. So it's not code. And then there's another reason he says that it wouldn't be code. If you need to decode something, every symbol has to have one meaning or the decoding of it falls apart. Um, you, Dad does the cryptic quote or did at one point, and if you're doing a cryptic quote, uh, the letter you're trying, you know, everything has to be the same or you can't solve it. You just can't. And what we find in Revelation is that various symbols, the meaning changes as you go through it from time to time. It's not always used in exactly the same way. And so it's not code per se. Uh, comments on was and is not in verse 8. Uh, it likely doesn't mean that the beast did not exist at the time of John's writing. This is some of Roper's comments. More likely, John may have been writing during this brief respite from persecution. If this is the meaning, John wanted Christians to know the persecution wasn't finished and that the worst is yet to come. Another possibility, three of the four major empires were in the past, yet the beast is because there will always be a new and improved version of anti-Christian government. Even once Rome falls, are there going to be other powers that resist God? Well, of course. There will be powers that resist God until Jesus returns in final judgment. Uh, at the end of the verse, was and is not and will come, some thought, well, maybe this is John taking the, the myth about Nero... Um, that he, you know, he went away, he's not really dead, he's going to come back. Maybe John's kind of playing with that myth, even though John wouldn't believe it. Uh, maybe he's playing with that a little bit, or maybe he's thinking about Domitian, because the statement about Domitian was, hey, this could be Nero all over again. Uh, it may re relate simply, though, to the amazing recuperative powers of the Roman Empire. In your favorite Marvel apocalyptic sort of movie, what's the big problem with the bad guy? Do you kill the bad guy easily? The bad guy always comes back. That's what makes these movies go on and on and on. You never really can kill the bad guy. And so it may be that kind of thing. Rome had this way of maybe they take a hit, but then they always manage seemingly to come back and not just be ready to give up yet. And uh, then the other comment here was, after Nero's death, the empire had some disarray with four emperors in one year, but after Vespasian ascended to the throne, the kingdom recovered and went on to even greater glory for a time. Uh, so the phrase taken as a whole, it may be an implication that the beast typified by the Roman Empire was hard to destroy. Another possibility is that the beast is being described as the antithesis of John's favorite description of God. We describe God that way, and here on the opposite end of the spectrum is the beast. So he says, I'm going to start explaining this to you in verse 9. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The NIV says, this calls for a mind of wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the, on which the woman sits. And so he's using Rome language. But then you get to the part that's, that's been the controversy. Who are the seven kings? Can they be described? And then uh, there is a school of thought that they were seven powers that ruled through time. And so many people have tried to identify the seven kings with seven Roman emperors. But the Kester points out in writing about it, which seven? He says, do you start at the beginning of the imperial period with Julius Caesar, 
or Caesar Augustus? Or would it begin with Nero, who conducted the first major persecution of Christians in Rome? Would the sequence include all the emperors of a given period, those who reigned for a specific length, significant length of time, those who were deified before John wrote, or perhaps those who fell uh, via violent death? And then he says this, No enumeration of Roman emperors fully suits Revelation 17, despite many creative attempts in this direction. And it goes all the way back to that comment from the beginning where Roper said, you know, maybe John's purpose here wasn't to give us a quiz on how well we know the Roman emperors. Something to think about. Kester then suggests the following. He says, perhaps a more helpful way to read the text is to recognize that John uses evocative imagery that resists decoding. He then points out the following related to the number seven. Elsewhere in Revelation, the number seven indicates completeness so that when John writes to the seven churches in Asia, he's actually presenting a message that's for the whole church. We talked about that early on. When he says that the seventh seal is broken in chapter 8, verse 1, the seventh trumpet is sounded, chapter 11, verse 15, or the seventh bowl is emptied, chapter 16, verse 17, he indicates the vision cycle has completed. Accordingly, identifying the seven heads with the seven kings seems to point to the totality of the beast's power. So again, something to think about. You can take that, you can leave that. You may have a listing of emperors that you really think is solid. You, you may have a listing of, of previous powers that reigned that you think is really solid. But again, we're actually not told, and you'd have to pick a starting point and an ending point and it's one of those where we're trying to solve a puzzle where maybe it does I mean, it really doesn't look like we've got all the information we would need. He says, picturing an eighth king as a return of one of the seven seems to play on legends that Nero re would return so that one could say of a future persecution of the people of God, it's Nero all over again. And I, I think we can identify with why that kind of statement might be made. Uh, verses 12 and 13 talking about the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who've not yet received a kingdom, but they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. These have one purpose, and they give their power and authority to the beast. Uh, kings of the earth mentioned in verse 2, possibly. If so, provincial governors and kings within the Roman Empire, they stood behind Rome because it was to their advantage to do so. Uh, most commentators believe that the number 10 should be taken symbolically rather than literally. Mounts believes it to indicate completeness and does not point to 10 specific kings nor to then European kingdoms of a revived Roman Empire. So um, again, it's one of those where you can think about it, you can study it, kind of make come to your own conclusions about it, but we maybe don't have everything we'd like to have completely say, well, we've got every piece of information we'd like to have. Uh, anything you all want to add there or bring questions up about that we might have to look more deeply into and, and discuss in a future session? Okay, Hudson's not here and Tim Aaron's not here, and that's probably why we don't have more being added right now. Those two, like I've said over and over, probably ought to be teaching the class because their knowledge of this stuff is amazing to me. Okay, uh, let's read 14 through 18, and we'll talk a little bit about those, and then we'll be done for tonight. These will wage war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them because He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with Him are the called and chosen and faithful. Uh, some have said, if you want to think about the theme of Revelation, this is the verse. Theme of Revelation. These will wage war against the Lamb. The Lamb will overcome them because He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with Him are the called and the chosen and the faithful. And He said to me, and we read this verse a minute ago when we talked about verse 1, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. In other words, talking about uh, a completeness, everyone, and the ten horns which you saw, and the beast, these will hate the harlot, and will make her desolate and naked, and will eat her flesh, and will burn her up with a fire. 
a, a scene of appalling carnage when they turn on her. For God has put it in their hearts to execute his purpose by having a common purpose and by giving their kingdom to the beast until the words of God will be fulfilled. The woman who you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Again, when you read about a great city which reigns over kings of the earth, what do you think about? You think about Rome. So, ten horns, probably these ten kings who'd been seduced by the harlot, who'd given their allegiance to the beast, but these kings are going to unconsciously and unwittingly be doing God's will rather than their own. Babylon has been pictured as seated on the beast, that's verse 3, emphasizing the king's dependence on both the beast and the harlot, but now the, in verse 16, the kings and the beast are going to turn on the harlot. Um, you ever been around a dog or something that turned on you? Friendly, and then all of a sudden, um, you know, that's kind of the picture that comes to mind. They turn on her. And the verse explains the how of verse 1 when the angel stated that John would be shown the judgment of the great harlot. This is how it's going to happen. This is a preview of how it would happen. Ultimately, her allies would turn against her, and these words are really a preview of the next chapter which describes the destruction of the city. In regard to this section, Roper quotes Homer Haley, who reminds us that Daniel chapter 2, verses 40. 2 and 43 had prophesied about the fourth great empire, which would be Rome, and saying it would be part iron and part clay, in other words, partly strong, but partly broken. And, and, and Haley's point in this was that Rome could conquer by force, but they had no cohesive power which, with which to cement the conquered into a, you know, a, a, a a kingdom that, that was cohesive. And um, this weakness that would occur had been revealed to Nebuchadnezzar in a dream all the way back in Daniel. Verse 17, it's one of those things that's hard for us to explain. We can't really explain how God put in the, these kings' heart or how God controlled them. Uh, I like what Roper says there, though. He says, we can, however, accept by faith that he did so. God worked to accomplish his purpose through these kings. Exactly how does he cause them to turn on her? We don't know exactly how he does that, or at least from the text we don't know here. Uh, but then he says the Bible's packed with illustrations which show God controlling even nations whose resources were pitted against him. It happens over and over. And so the conclusion from Kester in all of this, he says, despite the ambiguity in its details, the end of the story is clear. Evil self-destructs. The beast and its allies begin by waging war against the lamb, but they end up by destroying the harlot. After carrying the great harlot for a time, the beast overthrows her. The purple and scarlet gown and the gold and the jewels are all stripped away in disgrace. In other words, that, that outward appearance that Carrie mentioned... When they turn on her, that's all stripped away and you begin to see her for who she is. She who consumed the blood of the saints is now consumed by the jaws of the beast and her remains are burned with fire. He says, in an ironic twist, destruction by fire means that for the harlot herself, it's Nero all over again because under Nero, the city set on seven hills was devastated by fire once before. And that's out of the history, um, extra biblical history. In an earlier vision, Babylon was shattered by one of God's angels, chapter 16, verse 19. But here, God's will is carried out when God directs the forces of evil to pursue their own destructive course. The beast comes from the bottomless pit where destruction reigns, and the destruction is what it brings even to its allies. The sobering message of this vision is that God's judgment is carried out when he allows those who wreak destruction to become victims of their own practices. And so... Uh, that is the study of the harlot in chapter 17. That's kind of the overview, the, how, the trying to get through the chapter in one session. Anything else you all want to add about chapter 17 or any questions you want to bring out that maybe we would dive into at a future time?
Right. And they became ultimately corrupt. I think it's so ironic that over the years that have passed in Rome still today, that it's odd that there is a setting of a city inside of Rome that supposedly represents Christians. And then the Roman government outside of that, which does not. It's interesting. Interesting, isn't it? Right. Right. We were talking this morning about how God always has our best interest at heart, but when it came to asking for kings, he's like, okay, but let me tell you what you're signing up for, and it was exactly like God said it would be, and it wasn't good for his people. 